Did you bring your copy of God's Word with you to church today? Did you bring your copy of God's Word? So important. Uh, we were on our way out the door this morning, and I looked at one of my kids, and he was empty-handed. I said, hey, we're going to church, man. Come on, go get your Bible. So anyway, that's, that's, that's what I do to my kids. I know, call C CPS if you want. But uh, uh, anyway, turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28. Matthew 28, a very familiar uh, portion of Scripture. How many of you know, if you want what you don't have, you're going to have to do what you're not doing to get it. If you want what you don't have, then you're going to have to do what you're not doing to get it. Matthew 28, verse 18, just a very short passage today. Jesus told his disciples, go and make disciples. Jesus told his disciples, go and make disciples. In other words, Jesus came and he did something and he said, now, now you've seen what I've been doing. I want you to go and do what I'm doing. Is that fair enough? Jesus wanting us to do what he did? All right. That's just going to leave it at that. Brevity is is uh, powerful sometimes, and we'll just leave it at those two verses. Let's pray together. Lord, we want to become the most effective that we can be as your followers. And so, Lord, help us to optimize our potential and speak to us today. From the preaching of your word, your name we pray, amen. Amen. Just want to give a shout out to all those that are also tuning in online. And uh, thank you for joining the chat room and interacting and, and letting us know where you're from. I appreciate that from all around the world. Have you ever noticed the chasm that exists between where you wish you could be but where you actually really are. That has happened to me my entire life, that chasm between where I, where I really am but where I really wish I could be. But it serves as a motivation for me to, to do something about it and to work harder to get there. How about you? Let me give you an example. When, when I was in high school, uh, our family lived in a suburb of Dallas, and and it was the summer before my senior year, and I was so excited. I was finally going to get to be an upperclassman. I'd been an underclassman for three years, and I was just so excited. Oh, I loved my school. It was an awesome school. We had a lot of school spirit. And, um, and, and you know, there was just a lot going into my senior year of school. And, and my dad came home in August within a month before school started my senior year my dad came home in august and he and he sat our family down and he says family i got an announcement my job is relocating us to toronto ontario canada we've got to move and i was devastated i felt like my whole life was falling apart, unraveling at the seams. I loved the youth group that I got to be a part of at our church. And, and, I, and, and I loved my part-time job. We lived five miles away from the stadium where the Texas Rangers play, and I got to work for the Texas Rangers. It was a grunt job. Don't get flattered. But, but, but it paid well. And, and I loved my little job. And, and I, I, loved, I loved my school. I was on the soccer team at school, and, and so I had a circle of friends that I really cherished. I already had bought my own car and, and was excited about that, and the driver's license age in Canada was, uh, was quite a bit older, and so I wasn't going to be able to drive again. Uh, I, I knew where I was headed to college. I, I had life patterns, and life was comfortable. I was excited about life. And now, all of a sudden, my dad was yanking the carpet out from under me. All of my security systems that I had in place were now being all removed. 
So we hurried and moved to Canada so I could get enrolled into a brand new school. And I remember going into my 12th grade year at a school in, in, a, in a province of Canada that had 13 grades. So now I'm no longer an upperclassman again. I, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm going to this brand new school. I don't know anybody. I don't know the school culture. And I'm walking into the cafeteria on the first day of school with my sack lunch. And I survey the entire lunchroom, and I find I'm looking for a table of guys that I could relate with best, that I think I could relate with best. And so I'm looking through the school class, uh, cafeteria, and I spot the table that I am going to park myself in. I walk over confidently, I sit down, and I start to introduce myself to these guys and they're looking at me like, who in the world do you think you are? And they quickly informed me that this table is exclusively, exclusively reserved for the basketball team. And I don't fit. I also learned that that day that... This particular school was well known for its basketball. And these, these people at this table were not only stars of our school, but they were also stars in the province of Ontario. No wonder I didn't fit. But not to be deterred. That day after school, I marched to the gym and I walked into the gym at basketball practice and I found the coach. He was 6'7", and I introduced myself to him and I said, I want to join your basketball team. When are the tryouts? Well, he looked at me like, who in the world do you think you are? This team had already been practicing all of August, and, and the team had already been set. He'd already cut about 30 wannabes that wanted to be on the team, and, and, and the team was already set. And, and our, you know, the season starts in November, and this is already now September, and we got September and October to, to really get things together. And, and, and I wasn't going to be deterred. I said, well, I'm going to try out. Now, there were a few problems with that notion. Uh, first of all, I had never played basketball before. Secondly, I don't know if you can tell, but my particular uh, genetics did not lend itself to me knowing how to jump. I was only 5'10", and everybody else on the team was well over six feet tall. These guys have been playing together since the beginning of middle school, so they already had six years of chemistry together. There were so many reasons why that was a crazy idea. But I insisted, I told the coach, no, I'm, 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 I'm trying out. And, and, and in my gross lack of self-awareness, I thought, how hard could it be? to bounce a nine-and-a-half-inch ball with one hand and shoot it into an 18-inch rim with two hands. I mean, I'd been playing soccer on a field that, on a pitch that was three times bigger than the hardwood. How difficult is it to determine the difference between a guard and a forward anyway? Needless to say, that first day of practice, the tryout for me, was absolutely embarrassing and laughable. It's a great example of the chasm that exists between desire and delight. I desired to be in the in crowd, but it was a long distance between the delight of actually being in the in crowd. How in the world would I be able to span the chasm between desire and delight how could I do it discipline discipline I determined that if I was going to make the team in my last year of high school having never played before then I was going to have to work really really hard to catch up and and so remember if you want what you don't have, 
you're going to have to do what you aren't doing to get it. So, every day after school, I was the very first person to show up at practice, and I worked hard. I was the last person to leave practice every single day. Now, these other guys, they were practicing too. But on weekends, see, they would goof off. But on weekends, I practiced. I spent hours every Saturday and hours every Sunday working on my dribbling skills, working on my, on, on my shooting skills, memorizing the coach's playbook. I worked and worked and worked and worked. I didn't even own a basketball. I went out and bought a basketball, and I, I carried my basketball to church. I carried my basketball to school, to classes. I carried my basketball everywhere I went. I slept with my basketball. And I, I worked and worked and worked at this. I, 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 just, I just wouldn't give up. And, and uh, uh, meanwhile, meanwhile, I made a few friends at the nerd table in the cafeteria. But anyway, that's another story. Finally, finally, a week before our first game, middle part of November, week before our first game, the coach called my name and said, come into my office, have a seat. That tall, lanky frame, six, seven, leaned into me. He said, son, I'm going to invite you to join our team. I made the basketball team. I couldn't believe it. I made the basketball team. There it is. I got proof. I got my school yearbook right here, okay? The school yearbook, and I'm in there. And I made, I made the team. Now, I was only second string and didn't get a lot of playing time, but that didn't matter to me. What mattered was I got to sit at the table in the cafeteria. I made it. And there were quite a few privileges that went along with that status that year. But anyway, that's another story. There's always, there's always a chasm between our desire and our delight. There's always a chasm between the desire and delight, and the bridge to move from desire to delight is discipline. That is a principle of life. That's a principle of life. It's a principle of life. If you desire to advance in your workplace, to experience the delight that a higher position offers, then you're going to have to exercise some disciplines to get there. Might have to go back to school or learn a, a different skill or whatever. If, if you desire to look better and experience the delight of, of losing a little bit of weight, then you're going to have to exercise the discipline of a little diet and exercise. You know, you know the drill. The, the bridge between desire and delight is discipline. It, it's, it's a fact of life. If you're an athlete and you desire to represent your country in the Olympics, then it's going to take a lot of discipline, hours and hours a day for years, before you can experience the, the delight of standing on the podium and hoisting a, a medal. If, you desire, if you're a flautist and you desire to, to have that solo part in the upcoming symphony, then you're going to have to do a lot of discipline, a lot of practice in order to experience the delight of having your name featured prominently in the program. It's just a fact of life. If you want what you do not have, then you're going to have to do what you haven't been doing to get it. It's a fact of life. So in the same way, in the same way, if you desire to be a better follower of Jesus, then it's going to require some spiritual disciplines to experience the delight of being that mature Christian that you would like to be. It just doesn't happen by accident. So back to our text today, back to our text, just before Jesus ascended to heaven, his very last command to his followers was, go make disciples. That is God's will for every one of us, to be a disciple and to make disciples. Notice that Jesus did not say go and make disciples converts. 
There's a big difference between those two words. The mission of our church does not end at the end of a sermon on Sunday when we give an invitation to accept Jesus Christ. Now, that's a good practice, and that's why we're going to keep doing it every single Sunday at every one of our locations. All right? But it's a great idea. But the mission of our church only begins when somebody accepts Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Then what? Then what? We as a church are called to equip each and every person to move from the desire of wanting to follow Jesus better to actually experiencing the delight of being a better follower of Jesus. That is our calling, that is our mission, that is our purpose. That's why we open our doors every day. So how do we accomplish that sacred goal? How do we do that? We do that by introducing some spiritual disciplines so that people can actually get there. Can I just tell you something? Spiritual anemia is not an option in the kingdom of God. Spiritual anemia is not an option in the kingdom of God. If we fail there, then we fail everywhere. It's that important. And so Jesus has called us to become his disciples. He never mentioned become my convert. He called us to become his disciples. And, and the word discipline and the word disciple are actually from the same root Latin word. Did you know that? The word is deceer. It means to learn. And so to be a disciple means you, you learn the new ways of your mentor and you abandon your old ways. That's what a disciple means. A, a discipline means that you learn new habits that are going to be beneficial to you and you abandon the old habits that were holding you back. The word discipline and the word disciple come from the same root. They're fruit from the same tree. You cannot be a disciple without discipline. Now, now that we've said that, how many of us would be willing to admit, you know, I could probably, there's probably some margin of improvement in my own life. I could be a better disciple of Jesus. Anybody here besides me? I could be better. Oh, look around. You're not alone. Oh, wow, that was cool. Would you just raise your hands again? Let me just see all that. Okay, I, now I don't feel near as embarrassed. Okay, we're all in this together. We're all in this together. And so if you want what you don't have, then you're going to have to do what you haven't been doing to get it. And so... Uh, I went through the scriptures a few weeks ago in preparation for today, and, and I identified about 21 different disciplines. Now, uh, we're not going to spend the next six months going through a series on disciplines, okay? Uh, uh, I'm not going to share all 21 that I found today. But how about we just capitalize on three? And we've already been talking about them for, since the beginning of this year, we're just going to give you the why behind the what and, the, and maybe a little bit of how. All right? And so let me just introduce to you three disciplines, or not introduce, you already know them, but to capitalize and highlight three disciplines, three practices that all of us here and watching online can put into practice so that we can actually become a little better at following Jesus this year 2022 are you with me are you with me okay i'm so glad that today is the day for you all right well the very first one is daily bible reading daily bible reading now you see that i've got some props up here let me just i'm so glad you came today because i want to show you a magic trick are you ready i want to show you a magic trick now you got to really lean in and watch this carefully because the sleight of hand can trick you all right are you watching you watching watch this watch Watch. It opens. <laughs> it opens. Imagine that. 
There are so many unopened Bibles in this community. They haven't been opened in months. It opens. And when you open it, there's words from God to us. God inspired them himself. God inspired every word of the Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. God moved upon every author of the Bible, about 40 of them. He moved upon him, them in their spirit, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. Why did God do that? Because God wanted to reveal himself to every single one of us. You want to get to know Jesus better? Then read his letter to you and you will get to know him better that's how we get to know God more intimately after our family moved to Canada uh, uh, it was a tumultuous first few months but but you know we got used to it and and um, did you know that I met Pam there pretty soon after we moved so it, did, it didn't turn out all bad actually it was actually really good I met Pam and and, uh, you know, over about a five-year period, we got to know each other better. We ended up falling in love. We got engaged. It was a sweet deal. But, but uh, anyway, uh, I had to move back to Texas, and, uh, and Pam had to move to Newfoundland. If you don't know where that is, it's the end of the world, and turn left. We're about 3,000 miles apart. This is before cell phones and before Internet email. And so we wrote letters, for all you that are 25 and under, that's, that's uh, taking pen to paper and writing your thoughts in longhand. And Pam would write more frequently than me, and she wrote longer than me. But anyway, that's another story. But we would write letters to each other, and, and back and forth for that whole year. Uh, I have still, after 36 years, I have the box of all the letters that I kept from Pam. This is all of her letters to me. This box is full of passion. It's awesome. Uh, I'll just show you, I'll just show you one letter. Dear Reverend Mark Morrow. She called me Reverend for a whole year. Now, after we got married, she dropped that title about two months into our marriage. But anyway, that's another story. We won't, won't get into all that. But anyway, imagine, imagine me on the receiving end getting this letter in the mail. I went out to the mailbox every single day, by the way, and just anxious. Couldn't get home fast enough from work to go to the mailbox. Imagine me getting the, that letter taking it in and not opening it and putting them on the shelf. Pam has borne her soul to me. She's, re she's uh, revealed her positions on different things. She's expressed her opinions and, uh, about things. Imagine if I didn't bother to open the letter and just put it on the shelf. We would not draw closer together. We would actually drift further apart. That's the risk we run when we fail to open the love letter that Jesus has pinned to us. This is a love letter to us. Just as Jesus saying, you want to get to know me better? You want to know my heart? You want to know my position on things? You want to know what my desire is for you and how much I love you? You want to know all that? Read my letter. You know, prayer is a great discipline. Church attendance is also a great discipline. I admire you all for being here given the weather threat. But there's nothing like reading his letter to every single one of us. Just reading it. And that's why we, did you know that, did you know that, did you know that there were some authors that actually lost their life because they were used by God to pen this letter? Did you know that? Did you know that there were actually people who were martyred because they dared 
to translate this Bible from, from Greek and from Latin into English. Do a study on John Wycliffe and William Tyndale, John Huss, the list goes on and on. People gave their life so that we could have this in our everyday vernacular. And some people just leave it on a shelf as if they don't even care. So that's why we introduced a Bible reading plan. Uh, you can pick these bookmarks up in the, in, the, in the lobby of all of our locations. But it's a, it, this is something that we as a church have produced. We didn't download this from an internet or anything like that. We, we went through the scriptures very, very carefully, meticulously. And we chose a Bible reading plan that we can all utilize. I personally, I've been doing this a long time. I personally am doing this Bible reading plan. And it's, it's, it's not just reading from Genesis uh, all the way to Revelation, all the way through, trying to do it in a year with every single verse. Uh, we, we went through, and this one is actually chronological. You can know the story of the Bible from from creation all the way to Revel uh, all the way to to uh, when we're in the heavens with Jesus in Revelation 22, and it's a chronological story of 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 the Bible. And we 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 delete we skipped over uh, genealogies and some Old Testament uh, commands that were ceremonial laws, and and uh, we skipped over uh, some some uh, uh, chapters that were prophecies to cities that don't exist anymore. And, and so you can do this Bible reading plan, January to December, going through verse by verse all the way through the scriptures in one line story. And when you get to the Gospels, the Gospels are four books that, that all talk about Jesus from different angles, but, but you end up reading things over and over. We went through the Gospels and, and chronologically from Jesus' birth to his ascension back to heaven, and every verse is just a thread of his story. <clears throat> it's a... It's just an exciting piece. And so uh, you can do this. You can do this. We take one passage in the Old Testament, one passage in the New Testament, not quite a chapter, and, and about three verses of Proverbs every single day. It took me about 10 minutes uh, this week each day to do it. And then it takes a little longer if you do the soap, which is you read the scripture, and then you, you have a journal, and you write down the observation, the application, what you're going to do with your life. And so that took me a little longer this week. And then you end in prayer. So, but, but if doing this just a few minutes a day, uh, over the long haul, the discipline of, of being in God's word will help you span the chasm from desire to delight. Did you know that Ephesians 5.26 says that Jesus makes Christians holy and clean, look at this, washed by the cleansing of God's word. Washed by the cleansing of God's word. Every one of us here have, have a flawed nature uh, because of original sin. We, but we can become more like Jesus as we read his letter to us. It's a miraculous book. It's unlike any other book. This book is alive and active. And when we read it, it cleanses us spiritually. You know, every one of us, when we get up out of bed in the day, in the morning, and we go through our day, we accumulate soil physically. We just do that. You don't mean to go out and wallow in the dirt. You don't do that. But just throughout the day, we just accumulate soil. That's why we need to take a shower regularly. All right? Did you know that Scripture is like our spiritual shower? When you get up in the morning just by going through your day, because we live in a broken, sin-prone world, we just accumulate spiritual soil. And so reading the scriptures is our, is our shower. And you can fool people. You can fool people by skipping a shower. All right? You can fool some people. But if you skip that shower very many days, <laughs> you're not going to fool too many people. All right? In the same way, if you miss miss a day or miss a, a week or whatever, you know, you can fool some people. You can still act the Christian part and all that stuff. But after a while, it starts to catch up and the soul starts to stink. And so I just want to encourage you to think of this as your spiritual shower. Did you know that it's also, 
It's also the power that we need in temptation. When, when Jesus was, was being tempted in the, in the desert, in the wilderness uh, by the devil, it's in Luke chapter 4, uh, when Jesus was being tempted, the Bible says that, that the devil waited for an opportune time. There are times when we are more susceptible to doing something wrong than others. Right now, you may not feel that. But you know what? Tomorrow when you're by yourself, you, you, might, you might feel that. And so Jesus used Scripture every single time when he faced a temptation. He always responded, it is written. It is written. It is written. If you want to watch the devil scurry fast like a cockroach when you turn a light on, then just open the Scripture and quote it. Oh, man, that's the best defense against temptation. And, and so Jesus did that. But Jesus had to know the word in order to use the word. And so just a thought, just a thought. All right, the second discipline that we want to introduce this season, we've introduced a Bible reading plan, something that every one of us can do. All right, it's all scalable. You jump on wherever you can and go out and get the, 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 the bookmark and start today and, uh, and start that. The second one is... A 21-day season of fasting and prayer. Now, we've already started last week, but it's not too late if you didn't get on. Uh, uh, it's not too late. We can still do this. But when we do this discipline of fasting and prayer, we gain spiritual strength. It is a spiritual workout building our spiritual muscle. All right? In Mark chapter 9, in Mark chapter 9, there was a, a man who had a son who was suffering from being demon-possessed. The Bible tells us that when the evil spirit seized him, he would throw the poor boy on the floor violently and cause him to foam at the mouth and grind, mouth and grind his teeth and become rigid. And so the disciples uh, tried to cast this demon out of this boy, and, and they failed and caused quite a commotion, a lot of onlookers and spectators were watching and and it was an embarrassing moment for God's uh, for Jesus's uh, 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 friends and and but when Jesus showed up Jesus immediately cast the demon out of the boy and set the boy free once and for all and so later when the disciples were hanging out with Jesus privately by them by himself uh, they said Jesus why could we not do what you did so easily and Jesus readily told them in, in verse 29 of, of, of Mark chapter 9, Jesus replied, this kind can come out only by fasting and prayer. There's a direct connection between spiritual strength and fasting and prayer. Now, I'm talking about fasting and prayer. I'm not talking about just fasting. If you do fasting without prayer, it's just a miserable diet, okay? But fasting and prayer. God wants us to become powerful in spirit. And so fasting is like an exercise. The more we do it, the, the stronger we get. Let me tell you how it works. In fasting and prayer, you deny what your body is craving. Okay? And so uh, we all have natural bodies. We crave things. I, I crave Big Macs. Okay? I love Big Macs. All right? And so uh, uh, just, this is something I grew up with. So when, when we enter to a season, we say, you know what, I'm going to deny my body something that I like so that I tell my body who's in charge. I'm going to tell that craving, craving, I don't care what you want right now, I'm the boss, and for this season, we're not going to do that. We're going to do this. And, and so by informing your body that you're going to deny that craving for that season, you exercise some strength so that... The next time your spirit craves something that's not right, that's a sinful thing, you've got the experience, you've got the strength to say, nope, we're not going to do that. I'm in charge, and we're not going to cave into that particular sin. And so uh, whatever your body is craving. Now, you can do a complete fast where you don't do food, or you can do a partial fast where you say, I'm not going to do sweets or or, uh, or sodas or whatever, whatever your body's craving at, whatever maturity level you're at, this is between you and the Lord, you just say, I want to identify something where I'm going to deny myself for the next few days and tell my, myself who's in charge and overcome that so that I can go deeper in Jesus. 
Some of you may want to consider a soul fast where, where maybe you're, you crave uh, what's on the screen. Maybe it's already been 20 minutes in the sermon. You're already wondering who what's on my Facebook page. I better check it. And we're addicted to certain things. And we start telling our life, you know what? Right now, we are not going to cave into that craving. We're going we're gonna, to uh, tell myself who's in charge. We're not going to do that right now. And so you, you deny yourself the screen, whether it's television or, or, fa or social media, whatever it is, uh, just for a short season. We're not trying to become ascetic. We're not trying to be monks or anything. We're just telling ourselves who's in charge. I've been so inspired this past week by, by, uh, by different people and hearing their stories. I'd like to introduce you to somebody. Uh, Asher, would you come up here for a second? Come on, run up here, buddy. All right, this is, what's your name? Asher. Asher Lewis? Yeah. This is Asher Lewis. Okay, just turn around and look at there, buddy. Now, how old are you, Asher? Eight. You're eight years old. And are you participating in this 21 days of fasting and prayer? Yeah. You are? And you're eight years old. What did you choose to deny yourself just for a season so that you could get closer to Jesus? Sugar. Sh sugar? Wow. All right, so... So no candy, no sweets, no desserts? No. No, you, you, you like sugar, don't you? Yeah, so do I. But just for a season, right? And you're telling yourself, no, I'm in charge. I want to get closer to Jesus. Is that right? Yeah. All right. I'm so proud of you. If an eight-year-old can do it. <clears throat> All right, well, Okay. Galatians 5.17 says that our spiritual nature wants what is opposite to our sinful nature. And our sinful nature wants what is opposite to our spiritual nature. And so the more that we empower our spiritual nature by just doing simple things like an eight-year-old Asher can do, then the more victorious we would become in every other aspect of our Christian walk. You see, if we want what we don't have, we just have to do what we haven't been doing to get it. I want to invite you, if you would, just for a moment, just to identify something in your life that you can do without just for a couple of more weeks, just until the end of the month and say, I'm going to do that. I'm going to deny myself that for a couple of weeks as all of my other friends are doing it so that I could grow closer to Jesus. The third discipline that I'd like to introduce today, so we have a Bible reading plan, and you can pick this up in the lobby, or, or if you're watching online, we also have it available on our website. We'll be ready to roll out the February one uh, next Sunday, um, or two Sundays from now. But then we also have the 21 days of fasting and prayer. And here it gives you uh, uh, the different kinds of fast, the complete fast, selective fast, partial fast, soul fast, different ones. You pick whichever one fits you, all right? And then on the back, it's got a daily prayer emphasis for 21 days. Jump in and join us on this journey. Let's do it together and have fun together as a church and grow together as a church. The third and final discipline we want to talk about today is, is building our finances God's way. Building our finances God's way. Speaking of the conflict that's between our spiritual nature and our sinful nature, uh, nowhere do those ways seem more polar opposite to each other than the management of our personal finances. All right? I'm not talking about giving to the church. I'm talking about way more than that, what the Bible has to say about the entire spectrum. Uh, the Bible informs us again and again that the barometer, the barometer of our priorities is our pocketbook. This is the barometer of our priorities. How you manage this is the greatest revealer of who you really are and what you really value. 
And the Bible has a lot to say about it. In Luke chapter 12, verse 34, Jesus said, Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Over and over and over in Scripture, God instructs us on how best we can manage our finances. If we do it His way, if we do it His way, then we will experience financial freedom. The problem is we keep insisting on doing it our way, our sinful, selfish way, and we end up again and again falling into financial bondage. And Jesus says, oh, it's so much better for you. If you can just learn the disciplines of God's way and do it consistently, you will find freedom. The rewards are plentiful. And that's why we're offering this teaching called Building Your Finances God's Way. We introduced it last week, and it's just six chapters long. You'll learn what the, what the God of the universe has to say about uh, money and possessions and how you can practically apply God's word to your, to your life, God's word to your life, and how you can grow in your financial journey together. Uh, we're going to learn so much more about what it means to earn, what it means to spend, what it means to invest, what it means to sow, what it means to have contentment, what it means to manage debt, what it means to be prepared for the challenges that are going to come in your life, all those things. And so I want to invite you to sign up. We have a sign up on our website. You can sign up and say, I want to do that. I want to, I want to jump in and join my church journey in these disciplines. I want to, I want to do that. We, we're offering it through our connect groups. Our leaders were trained last uh, Sunday night, so we're ready to unroll that this week in our Connect Group launch. Uh, if you don't have a Connect Group or if that you can't meet that night with your group, we're also offering it at our Kingsway location on Monday nights. Uh, uh, feel free to come out on a Monday night and, and join us. And, and it's a six-week journey together of building our finances God's way, picking up the disciplines that God has shown us, overcoming our carnal ways and doing it God's way. So, Bible reading plan, check. Easy to do. 21 days fasting, we're already one-third into it. Join us on the journey. Identify something you can deny yourself temporarily. And then building our finances God's way. Just three disciplines out of so many that we can implement so easily and start doing what we haven't been doing so that we can have what we haven't had. What a blessing. What a blessing. I just want to invite you to think about this. Maybe somebody here today that says, you know what, I'm going to start doing that, but I don't know Jesus yet. I, I just don't know Jesus. I shared this message last week on disciplines gave him the opportunity at the end of the service and several people raised their hand and said I want to follow Jesus I just believe that as we've been talking today the Holy Spirit's been at work and there may be somebody whose heart just feels a yearning I want to follow Jesus I want to surrender my life to him we're going to close in prayer and I want to invite you to invite Jesus into your heart can we close our heads, bow our heads and close our eyes Nobody looking around. I just want to ask the question, would you like to invite Jesus into your heart? We have people every Sunday that check the box there on the line, say, I want Jesus into my life. If that's you, wherever you are, check that. Let, them, let us know. If you're here, I'm going to say a, a prayer in just a minute that many of us have prayed. And I, I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me. Would you do that? Just before we pray the prayer, I'd like to ask, who's going to pray it with me? Can I just see your hands real fast? Can I just raise your hand? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. I see you. Thank you. Anybody else? Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, sir. I see you. You can put your hand down. Thank you so much. Wow. How special. The presence of the Lord is here, just knocking on hearts gently wanting to 
invite himself in to be intimately acquainted with you. Can we all pray this prayer with these folks that raise their hands so they don't feel singled out? Can we do that together? Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I need you. I admit that I need you. I admit that I need you in my life. I need you in my life. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe in your forgiveness. I believe in your forgiveness. I believe in your kindness and mercy. I believe in your love for me. I believe in your love for me. So Lord, I confess my sin. So Lord, I confess my sin. I confess my need of you. I confess my need of you. And now I desire to follow you. To follow you. The rest of my life. The rest of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Can we celebrate Jesus?